But he said, you know, they could all vote. And this impressed him tremendously. Shortly before the start of World War I, Ho left America and sailed to England. He found work in the kitchen of the famous Carlton Hotel under the legendary French chef Escoffier. Escoffier is very impressed by Ho because Ho speaks French, because he's very courteous, and eventually is promoted to being the assistant pastry chef. While in London, Ho had met many other passionate anti-colonialists from places like India, Africa, and Ireland. These contacts rekindled Ho's own nationalist notions. He rededicated himself to liberating his homeland. In 1917, he decided to forego a promising career as a pastry chef and move to Paris. He would learn how to become a revolutionary. Ho Chi Minh arrived in Paris toward the end of World War I. There was a large Vietnamese community living there. But more important, this was where the decisions that affected colonial Vietnam were made. Ho was determined to help change French policy toward his country. But first, he wanted to experience Paris. He wandered around the town and uh, would go to art galleries, uh, take in lectures, improving his French. He used to love to go to music halls, and uh, one of his favorite singers was Maurice Chevalier. And he memorized these songs and, and went on for the rest of his life, uh, uh, without the straw hat, of course, uh, singing Maurice Chevalier songs. In Paris, Ho supported himself through a variety of odd jobs. He worked as a cook and he retouched photos. He even reported on boxing matches and reviewed films for a French newspaper. Of course, his primary goal was to somehow organize Vietnamese expatriates into a movement that would pressure the French government into improving conditions in his homeland. People who encountered Ho Chi Minh in those days tended to say pretty much the same things. A uh, very intense young man, very anxious to learn, very idealistic, uh, a man very much driven by ideas. But what was remembered about him perhaps more than anything else was his sharp eyes that uh, essentially seemed to penetrate the soul of the person who was talking to him. Ho discovered that there were many Frenchmen who were sympathetic to his cause. These liberals encouraged him to join their socialist group and to write and publish his own ideas. Soon, Ho and other Vietnamese expatriates began publishing an anti-colonial newspaper directed toward the Vietnamese community in France. Their leaflets were even smuggled back to Vietnam. All of his writings really are on that theme. What a rotten deal colonials are getting all over the French empire, which indeed they were. Ho's point of thinking is, how do you fix this? Do you fix it with revolution? Do you fix it with violence? Uh, how do you do it? Writing under the pseudonym Nguyen I Quoc, or Nguyen the Patriot, Ho simply advocated better treatment and equal rights for his people, not revolution. He achieved a near legendary status in certain circles back in Vietnam, where his rhetoric was considered visionary. Ho also attracted the attention of the imperial regime back home. They accused him of inciting treason and condemned him to death if he ever returned to Vietnam. In 1919, U.S. President Woodrow Wilson traveled to the Versailles Peace Conference to present his famous 14-point plan for world peace. Ho and his associates discovered that one of Wilson's key points was that all nations deserve the right to self-determination. Ho believed that this meant that the U.S. was advocating the end of the colonial system. And Ho Chi Minh, thinking that this might apply to Vietnam, got himself all dressed up in a cutaway coat and striped pants and a top hat 
and he went out to Versailles carrying with him a document that he had written which was a kind of uh, inventory of various cases of French repression in Vietnam and his idea was to give this to Wilson so that the United States would then exert pressure on France well he got very rudely rebuffed when he tried to go in to see Wilson or even deliver this who had believed that President Wilson would be sympathetic to Vietnam's plight he was greatly disappointed that he was unable to present his case this forced him to look elsewhere for help. A socialist showed Ho a paper that had been written by Vladimir Lenin. In it, the Soviet leader wrote that one of the keys to the spread of communism was the liberation of all colonies. The Russians wanted to end colonialism not because they loved the people who were under colonial rule, but for their own selfish interests, they wanted to weaken the Western powers. But regardless of what their motivation was, they were the only power at the time to advocate it and to actively want to offer help. And it's at that point, as he basically points out, that he determined to become a follower of Lenin, not because he had any understanding of Marxist ideology, but because he loved the strategy that Lenin had set forth as a means of liberating the colonial peoples. In 1920, Ho became one of the founding members of the French Communist Party. He was 30 years old. He had become a great propagandist while living in Paris, but he wanted to learn how to turn rhetoric into revolutionary action. He believed there was really only one place to learn this craft, Moscow. In 1923, Ho received an invitation to join the Comintern, the organization set up by the Soviets to export Marxism and Leninism around the world. He jumped at the opportunity. He disappeared from Paris, leaving his friends wondering what had happened to him. I think what drew Ho to Moscow, first and foremost, was nationalism, the desire to find help to liberate his country and his people. Ho became an important member of the Comintern. He now took his orders from Moscow. I always felt that Ho Chi Minh had very little time for Marxism as a philosophy, as a way of interpreting history. He had great admiration for Leninism and the techniques and the methods to be used. The rest of the world may have abhorred Lenin's tactics, but Ho was devoted to them. He believed that he had found the blueprint for liberating his homeland. Ho received his first international assignment when he was sent to Canton in South China to help organized communist cadres. It was here that he also began a clandestine lifestyle that would last nearly 30 years. He went underground, so to speak. And you have him wandering around the world under a wide variety of aliases. Some of them Vietnamese, some of them Chinese, depending on where he was and what purpose he needed. If, for example, he contributed to a French newspaper, he'd call himself Victor Le Bon. If he uh, contributed to a Russian newspaper, he'd call himself Nafransky, and so forth. In 1927, Ho was nearly arrested when the Chinese nationalist leader, Chiang Kai-shek, turned against the communists. Ho narrowly escaped